Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to share with you my experience and the experience of the Polish Agency for Entrepreneurial Development in implementation of the innovative program of supporting business in Poland. I'd like to tell you a few words at the beginning on why such a program was needed in Poland and why we decided to implement such a program. In 2007, the program was prepared under the program Innovative Economy, financed or co-financed rather from the European Union structure funds. So, the program was being prepared before 2007 and was implemented, in fact, in 2008. So, in fact, there were key reason, two key reasons which decided that that program was prepared in Poland and is still being implemented. First of all, both before the 2007 and still now, uh, the access to financing e-business and startups is still limited. I'm talking here about uh, funds which are not public funds. In 2008, there were a dozen or so venture capital funds on the public market in 2011 there is already there are already 60 funds like that venture capital funds but still uh, the funds are limited and the venture capital and private equity sector which is prevailing on the market uh, invested about 500 million euro in 2010 including venture capital uh, which uh, invested about 40 15 million euros. So it is, these are not big amounts. And what is important is the fact that these funds invest in undertakings and companies in later, more developed stage of development, whereas uh, the startup uh, undertakings and companies still have a very limited access to funding, especially that banks and the financial sector as such uh, are very reluctant to finance such um, undertakings in Poland. And I think that the situation is similar to the uh, other European countries of the world as such. The second crucial reason for uh, these limitations to, to access to funds is limited access to e-services. As the market for e-services was too weak in Poland during this time. So as it, we wrote it in our documents, we aimed at stimulating the supply uh, of access to digital products in Poland, which is supported by the numbers uh, on the slide behind me. In 2008, the market for e-commerce was worth about 2 billion euros, whereas in 2011, it is more than 3 and 5, 4.5 billion euros. The market for e-business this year is 8 8 billion euros. So this program was implemented in order to stimulate the development of e-business market in Poland. The program which is being implemented right now was embedded in the strategic documents which Poland had prepared for the years 2007-2013. It was called the National Strategy of Development uh, Strategic Frameworks, which uh, um, entailed then the innovative program, innovative economy. We decided that Poland 
and Polish economy should develop via innovative uh, undertakings and development of innovative companies. And within the program, all the instruments supporting innovative companies were prepared, as well as uh, supporting institutions in the business environment, like schools, institutions, and research institutions, so that the whole uh, environment creating innovativeness, uh, innovation was supported so that the synergy effects were created. Within the program, uh, one of the key areas of uh, attaining or reaching the level of innovative economy is uh, the development of e-economy. One of the programs prepared within this priority is supporting e-business. Apart from developing e-business in Poland, the program was also aimed at supporting young, educated people, uh, fresh university graduates who would like to um, work in business or start their career in business, who haven't uh, such an experience. And apart from supporting development of services, this uh, program aims at stimulating entrepreneurship among young people. Program. Ladies and gentlemen, supporting the economy program within the EC Access 8.1 within Innovative Economy program is innovative not only in a way that it supports innovative business but also due to the fact that it has been prepared in an innovative way. I believe that it's the first program of that sort in Poland which offers something more than simply financial grants. We offer a whole package um, like a, a training and educational package and uh, we prepared information portal um, run on our website and it's it is obviously administered by our agency and I will tell you more about this website later on um, however this program is so comprehensive also because those entrepreneurs who used our financial help within e-services program also receive educational support and more to the point later on on later stages of their development different programs offered by our agency so through those projects and further projects that will be run later on, entrepreneurs can expand uh, and that also includes expansion to international markets. So now let me present to you more data regarding the program. We allocated over 800 million euro to the program and that funds are either being used or will be used um, in the years 2007-2013 and within this program we've signed more than 2,400 contracts to do with e-business and e-services and that all is worth over 350 million euro and apart from the contracts that have already been concluded the program generated roughly 10,000 projects. We registered so many projects in our database. Um, 
some of um, the projects uh, were not supported by our agency because they did not meet all of the criteria set within the program or simply because um, our funding is limited. So, however, what's interesting here and, and what stems from our research, um, which is run from time to time, um, and he, uh, I'm talking about research on our programs, some of the projects which do not receive our funding for one reason or another are implemented anyhow without our help. Very often they use either own capital or the money that they borrow from friends, family or other sources. So they are able to implement their programs anyhow. But anyway, our program was an engine for developing a business in Poland. 3.5 thousand jobs were created during the implementation of our program and mostly that includes job positions offered to young people. People starting their business, young professionals right after graduation. Um, so it, it's worth noting that this program also um, realizes different aims of our government. We have a problem here in Poland with unemployment amongst young people after graduation. Uh, like they they can they, they cannot work full time as someone's employees. So through developing a type of enterprise amongst the young, we may fight the unemployment. Our research shows that around 60% of young people would like to run their own business as a sole trader, for example. So there is a potential which for some reason, usually due to lack of financing, it does not come into life. So now some more figures. I've already mentioned our website. Um, you see the address on our banner here. It's been created as a supporting tool to um, our grant program. As we decided that there is a need um, for more information. You can see the figures on my slide on the screen and you can see that, that, that we realized the need in the right way. Our website um, generates a lot of traffic. Um, we have a lot of young professionals entering this website. They use it to get more information on e-business in Poland. We have 11,000 registered um, users, 4 million hits, 4 million entries, I'm sorry. Over 56,000 hours were spent by our users on our website. They use it to get knowledge, the most up-to-date knowledge. Uh, we invite experts uh, in e-business. Um, we post the newest publications on the subject. I also believe that it's the best database for uh, e-business events in Poland. The most interesting events are posted on our website. Publications, which are potentially useful, are often 
and the entrepreneurs use our publications um, regarding the running e-business uh, the, the key um, areas of running e-business so far we've published 60 e-books on the issue and uh, around 60,000 people downloaded them uh, entrepreneurs however may use not only a website and not only the grants offered for startup companies we also offer additional support for example within the e-economy program that's a 3.1 measure and that includes startup incubators and that very often includes financing and generates e-business. Many of our entrepreneurs who received money within this program also used another program that's called Passport to Expert and within this scheme entrepreneurs may receive grants and expand to international markets they may perform market research they can go to trade fair um, set up business meetings so on and so forth people who wanted to open their own company and expand also used other measures offered by us for example the one within which we support those entrepreneurs who wanted to research um, a new product or a new service and further implement it within their business um, moreover people may also use support to implement electronic cooperation amongst companies that we have to have at least three companies and that's called a b2b support of our scheme the scheme as I have mentioned is being has been implemented since 2008 so this is the third year around 2400 contracts were concluded some of the projects are completed also already so they have been fully implemented and right now uh, these e-businesses e-services are on the market they operate in many areas like home business, finance, management, marketing, areas related to arts, culture, politics, the state, uh, law, administration. There are various uh, services which hadn't been there before on the market and have now appeared on the market. And many of those uh, businesses uh, have been successful the market they are earning profits and I think that after the support uh, period which takes place within the program up to three years all those businesses will be functioning on the market and they will succeed and compete that can be proven by a partly partly by the expansion of some of those companies into the foreign markets and their successes uh, on those markets and in different companies Competitions. Some of our beneficiaries have been succeed have succeeded uh, on international competitions. For example, on the competition organized by the Microsoft company. These projects also do very well in the world of big world uh, multinational companies uh, operating within the ICT area. For example, Nokia, Samsung, Orange, all that 
telekomunikácia polské kampany. And they are further expanding. As a continuation of this scheme and the possibilities, creating possibilities of uh, foreign expansion of our uh, businesses, we are preparing the scheme titled foreign incubators and we want to support entrepreneurs who want to enter foreign markets. Uh, for example, in the US, in the Silicon Valley, uh, we want to implement such a scheme there uh, next year. This is one of the examples for our project. Uh, one of our beneficiaries is uh, local governmental uh, SMS directory operating within the e-administration area. It is aimed at uh, informing directly uh, local citizen via uh, mobile phones. And this scheme solves via text messages. This solves uh, such problems like informing about some threats, uh, net also from natural disasters. Uh, it is implemented in cooperation with local forces. I know that many local governments have been using this program in uh, effectively uh, in the moments when certain areas were threatened by natural disasters, for example, like the flood. The scheme Innovative Economy and the scheme for e-business support are one of the programs which are being implemented by the Polish Agency for Entrepreneurial Development. Their innovativeness also involves the fact that for the first time ever, when we are addressing specific needs, we implemented in our agency the possibility to file motions via the internet and file applications via the internet. This solution has been uh, used for the first time in this program and we expanded it on the rest of our programs. And right now we are implementing several dozens of such uh, programs uh, supporting entrepreneurs. All, so all our activities have been digitalized and we are communicating with the entrepreneurs uh, via the website electronically and they can file all the applications via the internet which has been working very well maybe this is not an innovation in a global scale however in our Polish scale it is still an innovation because still not many institutions managing uh, programs of public support are using such a solution as I have mentioned the scheme for e-business support is one of our crucial programs. In 2011, we realized how important it is to focus on startup companies in Poland. As I have mentioned, there is a huge potential among young people who would like to become entrepreneurs and also a huge potential within among women who, on the one hand, are not active on the job market, but under uh, adequate support, they could start acting as entrepreneurs. 50% of women, uh, I'm quoting fresh data here, data uh, of a research which has just been carried out by our agency, as yesterday we had a big conference on uh, entrepreneurial attitudes among women. There are a lot of women in Poland who would like to pursue a business activity. And such a support uh, for e-business is also a great uh, example for the opportunities, opportunities for women in e-business. There is a huge group 
of women who have been implementing these projects uh, under the scheme supporting e business. And we want to and we will um, do our best to uh, implement such a solutions aimed at uh, company development, especially in the SME sector in Poland, uh, companies which are taking advantage of this potential and these opportunities. We want to use these solutions in when we in our programs. Apart from this, these programs, we are also supporting technological parks and incubators. So we are supporting all the infrastructure, supporting uh, entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs can take advantage of our single contact points and our network of uh, consultants, consul consulting offices. They can be consulted uh, in the area of pursuing a business activity. So we try to take a comprehensive approach to these activities so that a person who wants to become an entrepreneur and has just decided to become an entrepreneur, uh, receive if they need it, and all our research show that such a need exists, so that such a person can receive such a support, uh, and so that such a support is completed. To sum up, I think that this program of supporting e-business in Poland is a good example for cooperation between entrepreneurs and e-business and e-government and I think it's worth continuing this program and in the future we will try to uh, also implement and continue such a program uh, within our uh, new budget from the European funds. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and I think that we have a very little, a very little time for some short questions, remarks, inspirations. You can ask in Polish or in English, as you wish. No questions? Okay, Professor Salari. I like this program very much. And I like to ask you a question about uh, Young people of uh, what kind of education are mostly involved in, uh, in creating these e-business services? Does it go mostly to engineers, to economists, uh, or to, I don't know, human scientists? Uh, people of which kind of education uh, are mostly interested in this program? I'm not sure if I quite uh, if I understood you correctly. Uh, to w what group the, the program is addressed uh, was your question. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, the, the, the program is not addressed to any specific group of, of uh, young people. Uh, so anyone who, ca who wants, uh, uh, anyone who has an idea, have a, idea of, uh, have a project uh, that we can finance, uh, can apply. So there is no specific uh, criteria that we, we uh, select the, the, the people who can. Uh, but the, and, and from the experience I see, because we. we can often talk to the, the, the people who run the project. Uh, um, I can see that uh, there, there is a mix of, of, of uh, education uh, as regards the people who uh, applied and, and, and uh, uh, run the project. Uh, there, there, there are, uh, in some cases, there, there is a mix of, of, of uh, people like in, in a project where, where there is a social or uh, social media or, or, or kind of uh, uh, cultural um, or 
through touristic support. So th there are people educating in a specific um, uh, area, and, and and there are uh, ICT specialists. So so in the in the firm in the small firm, like uh, two three people mostly. This firm are uh, of uh, two three people and outsourcing. Um, and there are people from different different uh, educate with with a different educational background. Other questions? So in this context probably I have the other question about, you spoke about the incubators and clustering of startups and spin off from, for example, from universities. At this especially very interesting for us at the universities to, have the, to give the opportunity to our students to create startup and spin offs. So the question is, do you have a special programs for incubators to, to support such initiative internationally? Uh, some details to describe, probably I uh, have to, to switch to Polish. It's very important from the point of interest of the people. It's very important. Absolventi, especially wybijając się studenci, zostali w kraju. Graduates and especially outstanding students stay in Poland. One thing be to create incubators and build international clusters as well. But the question is, and that question refers to what Mr. Solari said: Are there any chances that um, the agency would support? initiatives that would attract students um, to go abroad, to dream big. Um. Well, chwili obecnie nie mamy takiego specy specjalnego, specyficznego programu, który by wspierał program e, e, inkubatory przedsiębiorczości i ich internacjonalizację, czy tych firm, które w ramach tego programu. Nie ma tego takiego programu w agencji, to znaczy, to nie znaczy, że w ogóle takich programów nie program ma. Jest inny program, 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 inny Tworzony inkubatory, like, gdzie um, przedsiębiorcy mogą incubators rozpoczynać bardzo łatwo biznesy. Są prowadzone działania, aby um, zresztą we współpracy z agencją, aby umożliwić uh, um, wyjście na rynki zagraniczne. Właśnie mówiłam o tych inkubatorach zagranicznych, które chcemy stworzyć. To jest właśnie this program we want to open our own foreign incubators and, and those incubators will cooperate with academic incubators operating on the market already and that should allow people to go abroad via educational support and information support. And this is a very important issue. There is a need. As I already told you that the we have a lot of potential. Um, there is a boom amongst young people to become entrepreneurs. And, and it's, it's not so common everywhere. Not in every EU member state. The young people want to open their own businesses. Other countries, there are countries in which people want to work in big corporations to be employees, so to say, to be employed. So here in Poland we have that chance that we should grab and uh, we, we are trying to design projects that would um, meet such demands. Thank you very much, Thank you, uh, for uh, students. Thank you very much for your presentation and for the discussion. <laughs> then I'm very happy to welcome the second speaker, it's Mrs. Lena Rotz. It's correct, or should I speak in English with Roots? Roots, excellent. Mr. <clears throat> Lena Roots graduated from the Stockholm University of Economics. It's something like our university. 
she joined the Swedish Agency for Economic and Regional Growth as a head of department for business services in 2009. She collected her excellent professional experience, for example, from the Swedish Export Credit Guarantee Board in Stockholm as first deputy chairwoman of the board. The Nordic Investment Bank Helsinki as member of the board. The Innovation Centrum Foundation Stockholm as a chairperson. The Swedish International uh, Fund as a member of the board. The Swedish Trade Council in Stockholm and the Commercial Bank as director and member of the credit committee. So, this is uh, a part of the list of your uh, positions. Uh, the subject of the presentation is Swedish Business Link, innovative cooperation for development of public e-services for business. The part is yours. Thank you very much for this long presentation, and I'm also very happy to be here in Poland. And I also would like to thank Professor Wojciech uh, Salary, although he's not here at the moment, and also Vinova, who left, and uh, for <laughs> inviting me to this uh, conference. I think it's a very interesting topic, and uh, the aim of my presentation is more on implementation. So how can government agencies work together in order to perceive and get better public services for entrepreneurs, in, in our case, and directly towards businesses. And it's all uh, really a challenge for public authorities to work together. It's very easy to say the word that you should do it to perform better, but it's more or less like a marriage. It's up and downs, and you have to do and to sustain and have to, have to have a sustainable development of the public services and the design and also to involve uh, the companies themselves in the development and production and design of these services. Unless you do that, you will not get anyone to use your services. So you can put a lot of financial resources into investments, but unless it's used by the end users, uh, there will not be any contribution to uh, the growth in the country. So you have to take up all the feedback you get, try to make it into better services and to a better design. So that's the topic of my presentation. And I'm also going to talk now about a project called Verksamt.se, which is really the Swedish business link. And it's... Uh, a project, it's really a strategic project within the government policy for the future e-development in Sweden. And uh, our agency is really an agency to work for sustainable growth throughout uh, the country. We are addressing innovative entrepreneurship and also, of course, regional growth because everything is really happening in the regions. So unless you get them to participate, we will not uh, have a good uh, growth uh, prospect in Sweden. And now when we have the financial constraints for the European Union, it's even more important to address the SMEs. Uh, for example, in Sweden, almost 95% of all the companies are SMEs. We have large corporations, of course, uh, that are well known outside of Sweden. But unless we can get additional growth for the SMEs, we will not actually succeed in promoting growth. Uh, we also have, of course, financial contributions, which we were talking about uh, at the last presentation here. And uh, one example is that we have now been supporting Facebook. They are investing in a big data center at the north of Sweden, in the city of Luleå, and that was a very recent decision made by them. They thought they had to have some kind of investment in Europe and for some reasons, which they know themselves, they choose Sweden to, to invest uh, in their data center, which is actually part of the cloud, cloud uh, development. And that, of course, is uh, very uh, uh, succeed, successful for, for Sweden and also for the future growth of that kind of industry. Maybe we can attract more companies to come to Sweden for that. Uh, this is the agenda of my presentation, but uh, I'm just going to start out with some background information 
And we have, of course, as all countries, an action plan for e-government. And, uh, of course, Sweden is also part of the digital agenda for the European Union. We launched it recently, and we have a lot of new schemes that we are presenting. Uh, we also have something called the e-delegation uh, for the government, and uh, where actually a lot of different, uh, 17 different uh, government agencies participate. Before we had one agency that was supposed to do all this work, it didn't work out. They put out a lot of good presentations, uh, suggestions, and uh, also other types of, of uh, innovative schemes, but the other agencies did not adopt what they presented. So now instead, all these 18 agencies are participating in this delegation, and we are supposed to ourselves come up with good strategic projects. We have to invest our own budgets into this. So the government has not put up any special funds for this uh, e-delegation, but uh, we are implementing it through cooperation between different governments. And of course, this is supposed to be more effective development of e-government policies and also e-government services. And uh, before, we had a lot of uncoordinated portals and websites. We had a very low level of usage. Many people did not, uh, were not aware of all the services that the public entities offered to them, and there was no coordination, uh, duplication of material and so forth. So all in all, uh, all these efforts are now being made to make public authorities work better together, and thereby also saving some funds to be able to put into new investments. And we have the budgetary process, which is a yearly process, and therefore it's difficult to have these kind of long-term projects involving different types of authorities. One of the authorities we are working together with, they are funded by fees from the public. So unless uh, they ha should increase the fees, they cannot really invest in new schemes. So we need to find ways of financing, and uh, that's not very easy for... Uh, we are... Uh, we are then guided by different uh, departments and, and ministries, and they all have their different type of budgetings. So unless we overcome all these uh, efforts and, and problems we have, the financing will not be in place, and we cannot continue this project. And throughout the time, there have been some difficulties. Of course, in these times of budget cuts, if we invest together with other agencies, and suddenly they get a budget cut, and they would like to withdraw from this investment. We have, of course, a huge cost for the rest of us to perhaps somehow co compensate for that some of us is not longer part of this uh, uh, investment. So this project is really a cooperation be between three different agencies. The Swedish tax agency, of course, is one the biggest one. We also have the Swedish Companies Registration Office, and they all have a lot of different data to, to proceed. Uh, the Swedish Agency for Economic and Regional Growth, we are really working for sustainable growth in Sweden. And of course, that's a very interesting job, uh, especially in these times. How can we sustain our growth uh, despite the financial constraints we are now facing? Um, but uh, this was really a bottom-up project. It was not uh, an assignment from the government it was really the three authorities themselves deciding we will, we will work together and try to get better public services. And the design of the services should be together with entrepreneurs. So we had to ask the end users what type of services uh, would you like to have and also to test with focus groups and test groups all the time throughout the project. So instead of offering different uh, services on our home pages, we have one page, uh, one common page, which is actually uh, accessed by the term verksam.se, the business link, and there you can have all different ty types of tools as well. And one tool is to draw up your own business plan. So before you go to the bank or to, uh, or to establish your company, you can work within this uh, tool to develop your own business plan 
and then you can actually show it to those that you choose to show it to instead of sending it around to everybody else. And of course you can register your business at one single place. So the former Minister of Enterprise, uh, Maud Olofsson, actually she has now started a company of her own and he used, she used his website and thought it was quite a simple to, to tool to, to uh, register her company. And uh, it's also been useful for, of course, uh, all those that have been using it so far. About 50% of all startups in Sweden are now using this uh, website for start up, starting up their business. And it's not only information on the websites, it's a lot of e-services as well. So we have uh, now increasing the number of, of authorities that wants to participate in this website. And uh, fortunately next year we will have like three or four new authorities coming into the project. And uh, also we are using uh, this to, to uh, address the entrepreneurs themselves and also private people that are considering to start up a business, unemployed people for instance. How can we make them think more about uh, having their company of their own instead of being employed? How can this be an attractive way of finding your own way of, of uh, financing your, yourselves? So uh, also for the ones who ha are helping the entrepreneurs, uh, there is a lot of advisors of course, public as well as private, and we're also making the site for them. We're now considering to do another sort of type of, of this uh, website only for those advising companies. And really when we started out, we said we don't really understand the process of the, of the companies uh, from the first idea you have of a company until starting it, running it and develop it and perhaps employ more people and finally closing down or perhaps uh, selling it to somebody else. So we started off by doing this type of uh, investigation of what is really the different phases and what type of support is needed from the public authorities throughout all these phases and what type of inspiration do we need in order to to find it interesting to continue and also to work more closely with our uh, authority. So we have on the website feedback and we have used that already from the start. It's this black stain here at, at the uh, right hand top level of the, of the site. And we have got a lot of, of different feedback from companies which we are now using in producing new products and services. So the co-production and the co-design is very important for us. And it's not only said by word, we're actually using it as a tool. Uh, and for the different phases, we have also used a new type of design. So somebody said that we were trying to impress women, or <laughs> thought it was a design used for, for impressing women. But uh, really, it's, uh, we're trying to be a modern uh, look of the website and uh, somebody said it doesn't look at all as an authority. Uh, but uh, that perhaps is also the idea <laughs> that it should be used by those that we are actually accessing with this uh, website. And throughout the, the phases we are then um, uh, cooperating with different authorities. So all in all it's information from 70 different public authorities within this website. But we are three authorities that have actually creating and, and production and, and development of e-services here. <clears throat> I'm just showing you some of these faces. And of course, if you are developing your business, it's also a matter of uh, hiring new people, employing new people. And there we are now working all together with six authorities. So six authorities are working more closely together, not only with the website, but also with other types of channels uh, to get out the information that we provide to entrepreneurs and to end users. And of course also finally you have to somehow uh, continue uh, closing down or selling your company and it's also a matter of sometimes of course bankruptcy. How can you hand handle that? Uh, in our country it's not a very good thing to do bankruptcy, in other countries it's, 
it's uh, regarded as a merit, but uh, uh, of course we have to work with these things as well because uh, we have an aging pro problem in Sweden where a lot of, of uh, owners of companies now are retiring and what will happen with all these companies, it's, it's a big problem for us and we have to address this, this question. And the organization is, is quite complicated, but uh, the idea is that we, we sit as we are in different cities and we work together and we develop the services together. Of course, we have all different cultures. So the Swedish tax authorities, for instance, they have their culture and uh, it's not always the same as we have. And, and uh, of course, sometimes uh, people internally in the tax authorities does not understand why so much time has to be devoted to this common project, because they have other priorities, uh, apparently. And uh, therefore you have to co constantly work on these matters. So if one of the managing directors is, are changing, you have to uh, devote a lot of time to sort of persuade these people that this is a good project, uh, please continue to put some funds into it. <clears throat> and we also perhaps hope that uh, we will include more authorities in the future. But the different uh, ministries that we are now, uh, well, we have different ministries uh, involved in this, and uh, at budget times, as we have now, it's not so easy to have a common approach on a common project, but different types of budget structure discussions going on. So I would say financing is, of course, a very important issue here. If you would like uh, public authorities to work more closely together on the long-term scheme to provide better services, you need to have some kind of long-term uh, financing in place as well for investments. And of course you can invite the private sector also to co-invest with you. You can outsource, you can procure services as we do along the, the line, uh, but at the end, of course, we have to stick to some budget funds to be able to, to go through. And the technical architecture here is really that we have joint services that we develop. Uh, we have also, of course, uh, information on the web page, and uh, some of it is called My Pages. You have to have an identification number, as we heard before, <laughs> to enter this page, and that's one important issue, of course. And then you can register your business plan, so nobody else can actually look at your business plan. And uh, some people thought nobody would actually dare or want to uh, register their business plan, but so far we have at least 30,000 business plans in use, and uh, so it showed them wrong, actually. Uh, and e-services, we de developed some of these services together, and also we have our own e-services, which we present through this website. So there's a joint effort, and uh, sometimes uh, we, of course, have to be agree on which type of e-services to publish on this website. Uh, user involvement, that was one of the most important issues here. And that was also something which took a lot of effort to have it not from inside out, but from outside in. Not to think about the authorities, different types of schemes that we normally work with, but to change the whole view of the people working with this project. We have to really give priority and focus on the needs of the end user and to involve them more and more in the production and design. Uh, we also talk about labs, actually. We are working now with the Stockholm School of Economics to see if we can have a lab on the web page and where people actually can develop their own companies and to get some support from advisors as well when you are doing that. Uh, we also are looking at an example from Denmark which is, which is called Mind Lab, uh, which is actually within the, the uh, ministries. Uh, and that is really about designing public services. So you also need some behavioral scientists involved, not only legal people and econ economists, uh, economic uh, skills, but also behavioral sciences to understand and design it from the beginning. Uh, our authority is also working with better regulation. And of course, there, instead of changing things after you have designed the legal framework, you should think about it from the start. How should we design the public services to fit 
better with the, those that uh, are the end users. And the implementation, which is really done in the reg at the regional level and the local level. So better regulation, we are now working also together with the mun municipalities and the regional authorities to see how can we together perform a better work when designing public services. Uh, and if you are checking on something, maybe you should then ask them from the beginning if they could have a better structure, then maybe you are not calling upon them to check things that often. Um, and maybe you can also diversify the fees depending on how good you are doing uh, instead of checking everybody. Uh, in this case, the technical approach was that it should be accessible, of course, with open standards and open source initiative. Uh, you also have the PSI initiative, of course, that you have to make data available for private sector to be able to develop their own services. It was a federated architecture, and uh, we also have distributed the responsibility for the development and the management of these e-services to these three different agencies. So. Uh, the e-services are provided as portlets, and then they are integrated into this web page. Uh, and that, in that way, the end users have access to all the services at one place. And uh, we can also include new authorities quite easily, because the structure is done in that way, so it should be easy to do it. And of course, there's also a possibility for the end user to overview all the work is, they have in progress. If, for instance, I have sent in my application to establish a company, I will also see when I sent it in, when I got the answer, and when I got the, the uh, permission to start up my company. And I got uh, okay for the name I have chosen for my company. Before you talked about one door, uh, we, now we talk about no wrong door. And uh, we have developed this website there is always a lot of regional and local authorities with the same ambition. So instead of inventing the wheel all over Sweden, we said, why not use the information we have provided? And then we link to the regional level and to the local level. So that is what we are doing right now, trying to see how we can link the local level uh, and the regional level into uh, our web page, instead of having a lot of structural funds, perhaps, <laughs> to develop new web pages all over Sweden. And so far, a lot of regions think uh, this is okay. Some of them already have their own web pages, but they will still link to our. Of course, the private sector as well is important, uh, and branch organizations and such other organizations we work together with. Uh, we will not replace them. We will just be as part of it all, and, and we should link to each other. So uh, we have more general information, and they might have more specific information about what are the advisors in our region, for instance, that you should turn to. Which type of financial schemes can public authorities offer to you as a company? You can find it at one place, instead of having to look at different web pages all over. Uh, to, this year we are putting in some $7 million, but uh, for 2012 we're going to increase this amount even further. We're developing new e-services, and uh, we also would like to look at social media, which, which was discussed before, and how can we go mobile? What kind of mobile services can we provide? Right now we have one service. If somebody is trying to sort of hijack your company, you get an email saying somebody is trying to change the names in your, your board, and you are uh, having a very fast access to that information. Uh, we have like 100,000 unique visitors per month, and as I said before, it's a lot of business plans registered. Our plan is also for them to be able to hand out the authority to perhaps to their bank or accountant or something to come into this web page and look at the business plan instead of, so they work together, they can also see all the registrations they have, they have made. And uh, throughout the years, I think we started off actually in 2008, late 2008, so it's not that long we have cooperated, but we are picking up on users. And as I said, business plans created and saved on the web page. Um, other projects we are now working on, as I said before, is uh, the regional level. 
How can we work together with them? We also have a cooperation with the university at Linköping to see how can uh, the local level, the municipalities, uh, what are the possibilities for us working together with them? And we have new projects now already launched. Uh, some of them is also uh, in training, and um, training civil servants at the local level to uh, have a better business climate in their local uh, community. And so far, I think at least uh, 60 local municipalities have participated in these uh, training sessions. And we also include politicians as well as civil servants. And the aim of the game is to serve companies better. And we have used a lot of different tools in this respect. And all the municipalities participating should also end this training session by an action plan. How can we perform better in the future? Of course, then everything is measured. Uh, which, com which communities are having the best business climate and which are having not so good business climate. And we're offering the tools for them to uh, actually improve the business climate. Uh, personalization means that uh, I think many countries already have that, but for instance, if, if I'm a carpenter, I can say when I enter the web page, I'm a carpenter, and the information is then structured so that I don't have to look at everything at the web page. A uh, safe electronic communication system, very expensive one, uh, to give every company an e-box for messages from authorities to uh, the uh, company. And um, this is a safe system we're working with. Uh, during our work, the public sector, the private sector uh, have picked up, and now there are at least three companies telling us we have the same solution, or we have a solution, so you have to use us. And uh, of course, then, the question now is, what are we forced to procure now? We have started the development, and that's a sort of also a legal question we have. What kind of system should we have in Sweden? And uh, for instance, when it's e-identification, we now have a system where we have different types of solutions, private solutions. And the question is, what type of solution will we have for, for this? And that's going, being debated right now with our government. Uh, the services directive, of course, is also very important, and uh, Verksamt is the point of single contact for, for uh, services companies coming from other countries wanting to invest in Sweden. Uh, there we are working with a new system for validation of e-signatures. Uh, of course, the, um, uh, there are different other types of solutions being developed at the same time of the Commission, but we think we have a very user-friendly, meaning civil servants at the public authorities friendly solution. And uh, if I get somebody's uh, signature, we have uh, worked out how to work with policy, what type of e-signature should we accept, and so forth. And this has been developed right now. We have presented it to, in Brussels, and they were interested in this solution. And we're going forward with this. Um, we, have, we don't know exactly yet where the Commission will land with that project, but we say this is really sort of member state uh, solution and could be used by other member states. And you work with the trusted list uh, solutions. Uh, it has been quite difficult to understand what type of solution the Commission is working on, uh, but uh, although we have made a lot of different presentations, we've had our experts there, and, and still it's very difficult to really come into this project. But the moment this is uh, you have this solution, I think it will increase trade over, over the, from country to country. So uh, it's interesting to watch what will happen with that project. Uh, we're working now with more business scenarios and smart e applications as everybody else, of course. Uh, but we would like to think that the infrastructure is something that the public sector should work on. Providing the, the infrastructure that is quite expensive and that could then be used by the private sector. I'm not sure how doing in time here, but you. A few minutes left, yes. Um, we think it's important not just to work with internet, but of course a multi-channeling strategy is important. And there we also work together now with at least six other authorities. 
uh, for printed matters, for, for uh, meeting and local offices. And we also have a start-up line where companies can call. And we're working with the libraries in Sweden, all the libraries. Uh, the question is really how to coordinate all these things. And uh, we all, uh, our, all authorities have their own help desk, for instance. And how can you coordinate the help desks? That will save us some money. We are working on that now. And uh, we also uh, have a lot of training sessions for civil servants in the sort of second line. Uh, they are working on uh, different local offices, and we are training them on how to, to serve better uh, the companies. Uh, still, people want to have brochures. Uh, we are handing out half a million of these every year, and uh, we thought of maybe stopping to print it, but it's still in demand. So we're having it uh, now in different languages, and also something called easy to read Swedish, uh, which is also for those not so familiar with the Swedish language. Uh, the starting up a business day, we are working also with the private sector, and uh, we also have a lot of, as I said before, uh, training of the front office staff. And uh, the way we do it is that they participate together with entrepreneurs at these business days. So. But the lessons learned here the, is that cooperation, of course, is very rewarding if it's successful, but it's also difficult. And you always have to convince people over and over again why we should do this. It's a matter of trust. Do we trust each other? Do we have the financial funds? Is this a long-term commitment? Are we showing our e-services on this web page, or do we have a separate strategy? It's very much about management and control, and it's very important to have the top level involved, otherwise you will not have the long-term commitment. Uh, we have worked out different methods to uh, organize this, and it's not, uh, we have now like uh, four different levels, it's too many levels, <laughs> and a lot of steering committees. It has to be linked to the <coughs> normal organization, otherwise it's very difficult to, to maintain. <coughs> the technical solutions, we have def different technical systems at these three different um, government agencies, and we have to somehow uh, try to make them uh, work together. Legal, legal matters involve the government. We have a lot of different matters at the moment discussed with them. How can we solve the legal matters uh, in a more quick and appropriate way? And of course, uh, that also puts a strain on how quick we can develop these services. I mentioned before the financing and the organization, which is quite a difficult task to, to uh, find good solutions. So uh, finally, I would last like to say that we will continue uh, we have uh, married these three authorities, and we include more authorities, and the reward is really that it's being used by many companies, and it's being used by many persons, but I think the, uh, for the future, uh, to work more with labs, to involve the end users more, and also to go mobile and use social media, I think that's the challenge. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it could be a really excellent solution for Poznań, because Poznań is also a city of SMEs. And uh, we, we are the city of students also, because we have more or less 130,000 students. So it's the same number like in Berlin, but Berlin is six times bigger than Poznań. So such, uh, uh, such uh, system, such portal could be very useful here in Poznań. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, do you have any questions, remarks connected with this issue? Okay, then may I have a question? Tomorrow I have a presentation uh, on open link data. And what do you think how useful could be the open link data for such a solution like yours? I think we have a lot of information on our web, web page, and I think that uh, there are a lot of private uh, companies wanting to make solutions. We had one solution here for, for uh, 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 safe communi electronic communication, for instance. So I think we are inspiring a lot of private
private companies to invent new e-solutions based on the data we are now providing. So I think that's the challenge for the future, to always to look at your uh, data and see what of, what of this we can present to, to the public. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> then we have to switch to the last presentation and um, our last speaker is Mr. Jeremy Millard. Jeremy is uh, from Danish Technological Institute. He has been senior consult with the Danish Technological Institute since 1999 after working with Tele Denmark for 13 years and moving from the UK where he worked in Open University in London, it's correct? I suppose so, yeah. You work, you work at uh, Open University in London, it's correct? For, you worked uh, at the Open University yes, yes, yes. in London, yeah. in the UK, okay. Many, many years ago. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and uh, he has some assignments for the European Commission, included leading an impact assessment for European e-government, uh, 2010 actions plan, leading large-scale European-wide analysis of e-participation, developing the e-government 2020 vision study on future directions of public service delivery, and he is also currently working as an expert for United Nations and OECD on the global e-government strategies. The topic of the presentation is the role of uh, role and opportunities for businesses in the transforming e-government value chain. Welcome. Okay, I'm going to stand up because then it goes faster, uh, which is good in the sense that I'm between you and your coffee. <laughs> but also maybe if I speak too fast, uh, you won't understand me. But I'll do my best. But, and I'll try to keep it short as well, shorter than I planned, okay? Oh, okay. Anyway, look, uh, what, what I, I'm interested actually in hard facts. I want to look at some hard uh, aspirations around this topic and actually what's happening as far as I can. It's difficult to get uh, hard facts, but there are some out there. Uh, we're living in very, very hard times. I may be using this word hard a lot. <laughs> we all know it's a financial crisis. Government is first and foremost at the moment, certainly the ones I know intimately, are looking to save money, not to invest in new things, which the outcome of which is a bit unknown. Right? Uh, we've had huge amounts of investment in e-government over the last 10 years, a lot of which has been successful and has really produced some impacts, but there's still big discussions about that. Uh, and so government is now, in many countries anyway, I can't speak for all countries, are, uh, is, is becoming much more cautious about how they invest. Um, we're looking in the sense, this context of this talk here, about um, business development, growth and jobs how we can use e-government to create those sorts of beneficial impacts uh, on society. Uh, we also at the cusp of a change in terms of technology in many ways, and it was well illustrated by Julia's speech and the other speeches, that there's huge potential with the new technology, spe specifically uh, social media, for example, to actually uh, have a big impact, but it's not really yet being re uh, realized. And uh, what can we do about that? Is it possible to use, for example, social media to actually improve government performance, uh, create business development and uh, add to growth? That's a big question which uh, many people are trying to address at the moment. I want to look at this from two perspectives very briefly. The first one looking at uh, business as users and I'm going to look at the procurement and two, uh, two examples there, um, UK and, and Denmark. Uh, and also I want to look at businesses as providers, as part of the value chain, how businesses, particularly SMEs, can come into the value chain of e-government and, and in, that, uh, in that way help, the government can help businesses to grow and to create new jobs and to have big, bigger impacts on efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, and this, these are many of the aspirations which many governments now have and I'm going to look at that quite critically uh, to see whether the, what the results so far of that are. We're talking about new business models in this context, opening up government to new actors, 
uh, not just in, 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 in uh, helping to design the services from the end user perspective, but coming in uh, at the core of government and helping government to design and deliver new types of services. So uh, government outsourcing, in a sense, is part of that process, but though that becomes very politically difficult, of course, in many countries. Anyway, let's, um, the first one, e-procurement is, is an obvious candidate to look at because there are huge benefits uh, for e-procurement. Uh, government revenues are about 45% of GDP in Europe. Uh, public authorities purchase 15 to 20% of that. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, and e-procurement, an e-invoicing, for example, which is a part of the e-procurement value chain, could save at least 5% of GDP if it was rolled out 100% and used 100%. But at the moment, we're only using 5%, you know, in, in, across Europe, only 5% of the value of procurement is done through electronic means. Right? So, ergo, I, I didn't do Latin at school, but I think that means, therefore, we're losing huge amounts of money, potentially, at a time when we're looking for huge amounts of money. I'm not saying that this is a simple solution, of course, because we know what the problems are. But in particular, SMEs could benefit from this. Uh, and in many countries, there's some good examples where this is happening. If we take... Um, um, let me, why isn't this working? Ah, OK, Denmark. But just, just, just what, before we look at the Danish case, a couple of things, because the I-2010 Action Plan, which was uh, agreed in Manchester in 2005, and then um, uh, put into the Action Plan for I-2010, said that e-procurement should be uh, available 100% across Europe by 2010. We know now that only about 71% availability is there, and, but we also know that the use of it is less than 5%, so it's a huge underachievement. That's some uh, data uh, uh, in a white paper produced last year. Um, so there is a big problem in the sense of take up. I mean, there are lots of reasons why that's not happening, uh, which I won't go into here, but, there, but in terms of legal issues and the lack, lack of interoperability, e signatures, lack of confidence, and all sorts of other issues. But, but there are huge variations by member states. Uh, we know, for example, that Ireland, Estonia, Malta uh, are over 20% uh, of their public procurement is done online. Um, another interesting indicator is looking at the number of foreign suppliers in, in a particular government's e-procurement database. Uh, and again, that's very, very low in most countries. So if you have, a, a in, have an e-government database, how many foreign suppliers are registered in that database? That's an inter interesting example of cross-border e-procurement, for example. Again, very, very low. But again, Ireland, Cyprus, Estonia, and Malta are over 25%. So, so there are countries which are leading in this, uh, so the, uh, and there's huge variation. But interestingly, these countries are quite small countries, as you'll notice, right? <laughs> in some ways, small is beautiful, and that's another discussion which I won't go into here. But Denmark is also a small country. And there, there are, you can see here that uh, e-procurement is, and Denmark was one of the leaders. It, back in 2004, this was uh, started. Uh, 2002, I beg your pardon. And saving now 25 million, 95 million euros a year. Uh, and that's increasing. Uh, E-invoicing, annual savings of 120 million per year. Now, that's interesting because there's two lessons from Denmark here in this. E-invoicing is now compulsory. If, as a private company, you want to do business with government, you, uh, you have to use e-invoicing. It's no, no choice about it. So you can see that's the reason the graph was shot up of course. There are some exceptions, of course, small businesses, you know, one-man bands, people going around repairing cars or other things, they do get some uh, exemptions. But th those exemptions uh, are through help given to make sure that next time round you do actually go online and you e use e-invoicing. So there's a strong you know, uh, drive forward to make these things as compulsory as possible. That's one way forward, of course, but it's difficult to do in practice. The, the other lesson from this, I think, is that you can do these in steps or stages. The e-procurement value chain is a long value chain. There are lots of different aspects of it. There are parts of it, like e-invoicing, which could be done compulsory and actually strongly supported in the first instance. And so I think the Danish lesson certainly is to, is to think in those sorts of terms, not to be over-ambitious necessarily and do, try to do everything at once. Um, and, and Denmark is, of course, a leader in this. Uh, and again, it's a small country, but uh, you, know, so you could argue that the lines of command are shorter. It's easier to organize these things. 
the, I want to look at a bit more at the UK in some detail in this context and the other context because the, the UK is an e-government leader in many ways but it's a large complex country in terms of e-government and government generally. Very, very complicated, a long history of lots of different uh, initiatives um, and uh, we had a new government last year. Okay? Yes, another new government, let, yet less another new, another new action plan. Uh, Yet another lot of new strategies and uh, things that the civil servants have to do and change. And the, and the, and the, the, the uh, feedback from civil servants is very often, oh no, not another strategy, not another disruption, not another plan to work towards. Why can't we have some stability occasionally? Yeah? So there is an issue around that. Transformation is very, very good in government to some extent. But, very, but there can be a problem for the government as an organization and the individuals within government and their competences and the way they work, trying to keep up and, uh, with all these changes that are taking place all the time. But in, in, in terms of the UK uh, business portal, which uh, is, is seen by many as to be a world leader, it is very, very good. It's currently, currently under review, as it says there. Increasing interaction, online training, single intelligence tax forms, a tax dashboard where you can go in and quite quickly see uh, you know, your situation, personal situation for your company. Um, I, I tried to get some data about whether it's actually increasing business efficiency. And the answer I got was substantial increases, but no, no one seems to have measured it. You know? So there's a lot of hearsay out there that it's, it is doing good things. And I, I think, you know, on the whole, I think that's correct. But actually measuring this stuff is actually quite, quite difficult sometimes. Now, I now want to look at the, the, the idea that businesses can be part of the value chain producing e-government services. This is part of the more general development here, uh, which has been uh, current in Europe in the last couple of years and is now in the Malmo Declaration, of course, that open and collaborative government, um, open for business, outward looking, open for collaboration, public-private partnerships. I've been banging on for years also about public civil partnerships. We need to think very much about the civil sector in this. I know this is not the subject of my talk, but the civil society is really also key in this when we're talking about providing services for citizens. But anyway, the idea that, uh, that there's more relevant talent outside any organization, including government, than inside it in order to do the things you want to do. And how to, the trick is how to harness that and how to identify it, harness it and use it without necessarily reducing services, without necessarily downsizing government, although that's a political decision which we, you might want to take. So the whole range of actors out there, it's the public sector, private sector, civil sector, different interest group, groups, communities, households, individuals, the hackers and the geeks, which we've started to be much more wary of in the last few years, and you and me, you know, uh, as individual entrepreneurs, academics, consultants, as you, and users as well. So really we need to, you know, open up our minds, as, uh, or the government certainly does in this context. And the whole uh, debate and, uh, and what's been happening in the last two years about open data, sharing everything in a sense, sharing resources, infrastructures for innovation, you know, the cloud is part of that discussion of course as well. There was, the UK is a leader in this, uh, in terms of thinking about it and perhaps doing it as well. Uh, 2008, there was a UK study which talked about if government data sets were open and free, uh, freely available, um, structured and, and linked so that they're easy to use, that's a critical issue, that it would save the UK government uh, 200 million pounds per year. Uh, sorry, it would generate 200 million pounds in increased uh, economic growth and jobs um, just from opening up six of the largest data uh, sources. Now I haven't actually seen any more recent studies on what the impact of that has been since then. But certainly there are serious academics out there who think that these, uh, this, this is possible. Just focus a bit more on the UK because it's an interesting example at the moment and it's going through a transition, uh, transition phase with the new government as I say. And also actually leading the way in some of the thinking. This idea here, which we talked a lot about just now, of the one-stop shop. Now the UK and other people around, the, you know, other countries are starting to say, okay, that's fine. But that's, you know, what many people aren't using portals anymore <laughs> uh, to, to find public services. They're Googling. I mean, that's another discussion. But so this idea that the, the, the future uh, is government services wherever you are, pushing services out to companies or individuals, whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you, you need them, right? You know, rather than having to go through a front door, or no wrong doors we just heard about, 
We don't, government goes to the user rather than the other way around. This is the aspiration. Now, this is, again, rhetoric, of course, but uh, this, is, this is their uh, official uh, uh, aim to do this. Now, the interesting thing from our perspective here is that the, the idea that, we, that they will create partner models with third parties, that means businesses and, 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 uh, and, and NGOs, who would uh, contribute at least 50% of the transactions f through e-government in the future. So really saying that government itself is going to be doing 50% or less uh, of the work in developing these new services. So other actors are coming into that value chain, uh, um, particularly SMEs, the focus is very strongly on. T to help boost economic growth and jobs, also to you know, downsize government to some extent, that's the political agenda of the government, but, let, but I want to look a little bit about what's been happening with that. The, uh, okay, this is, sorry, this is just before we do that, this is the, um, the uh, data.gov.uk website, which was the second after Obama's website, but it, many people now saying it is probably one of the best in the world, because it does actually have, it's a very, very good collaborative platform. It does have structured linked data, easy to use. You can see here the first thing you put in your postcode where you are to, to find out what data is available because it's now realized that a lot of this is taking place, taking place at local level. You know, we know that 70% of e-government services are local rather than national. Right? Uh, but also a lot of tools there, you can't see them directly here, but you know, setting up conferences, setting up blogs, setting up collaboration partnerships with you know, hackers and small companies, um, running competitions and all these sorts of things are all part of this ecosystem being, trying to be built up. It is, it is actually built up in the UK quite successfully. Uh, and you know, encouraging this as a way of Innov having better forms of innovation, of course, getting better services, cheaper services, much more effective services, but also boosting the economy in this context. You know, the UK sees these sorts of things in the IT industry with games and all sorts of other things as a really important growth industry for the future. And they're right, and so should we all be thinking along those lines, of course. Right? Uh, and they're trying to replicate things like uh, Silicon Valley with Silicon Roundabout in East London, which is probably where, near where Julia lives, for example. Lots of things happening where government money is going in uh, and trying to create the conditions where those sorts of things can happen. And I think those things are very, very important. But anyway, uh, when the new government came in last year, they, they, they realized that government, UK government ICT had a really bad name. We just had the failure of the uh, NHS National Health Service backbone, which cost billions of pounds and underperformed. And as far as I know, it's, it's been stopped now, though bits are trying to be saved or retained. So government IT projects have a bad name. No, we do know, of course, that all big IT projects in the private sector as well also fail very often, but you don't talk about that because you don't hear about them. So, okay, so maybe some of, those, uh, some of that criticism is unjustified, but there are big issues. Governments cannot handle these issues very, very uh, well, um, because most of the supplies are large companies who run rings around them by and large. And so they've tried to, the last, the last year the government, when it came into office, tried to look at some of the issues and tried to see how can we address this? Because we do want to get better government services, but we also want to make sure that we get spin-offs in the economy, which can benefit growth and jobs. So th th this idea that uh, a presumption against large projects, large projects tend to fail more than small projects. Is, is the new mantra, uh, creating a competitive marketplace for SMEs. Um, but there are going to be some big projects, but there's too little attention at the top on big projects. You know, the management of big projects is not good enough, basically, in, in government. Yeah? Um, and the people who are responsible for them often leave and, don't, and aren't, aren't accountable. So really trying to tighten the screws on that. Procurement takes far too long. I mean, procuring the, the NHS backbone in the UK was a hugely problematic and convoluted process, which really you know, should never have happened in that way. And again, there's the common problem about systems uh, systems being interoperable and uh, or n not being interoperable enough and uh, not en enough sharing going on. So the idea of now of a government cloud and open standards. I mean, we, you've heard all these things before, but this is, again, the new rhetoric of the new government uh, w with quite a tight uh, time schedule, trying to do most of this within a couple of years. Um, other issues around this were systems a bit are rarely being reused or adopted for reuse. Um, creating a cross-agency app store 
a comprehensive asset register of applications, but also resources and, and skills and other, and other assets across governments so that it can be more readily shared between ministries and between agencies. This idea of going digital only, identifying services where you would close down the traditional channels and just rely on, on digital, which in, in some ways can be is highly problematic. We're doing this in Denmark to some extent as well. It's okay for businesses, of course, by and large, yeah? but when you start to extend that to citizen services, then you, you could have problems, although there are ways of getting around that. Yeah? But the interesting things here, uh, two things here about trying to create this distribution network beyond the government, this ecosystem, using uh, application program in interfaces here to allow third parties, which, and they're talking mainly about SMEs here, um, to actually develop content and transactions on behalf of government. Uh, and establishing what they call a SWAT team, a digital e-government SWAT team, which can go across the different ministries, go in and help the different ministries develop their services, but they've got the competence and the knowledge and the sharing from, from, other, uh, from other ministries, for example. And this uh, establishing the government skunk works, you know, this idea that it's a very informal, open lab with lots of young, innovative uh, geeks running around and developing new ideas, you know, directly putting money into that. It's at the heart of government. Uh, and to see you know, what, what benefits that can spin off in terms of new services, but also having these direct links with the SME community out there and, and, and developing new forms of growth like that. So these are all things we have started about a year ago. I've been talking to some people in the, in the cabinet. Anybody here from the cabinet office in the UK before I... <laughs> oh dear, okay. <laughs> it's what I've said so far. <laughs> Anyway, maybe I'm talking to the wrong people. I think it's all very good in many ways, but it hasn't worked so far. And some of the, um, some of the uh, uh, sort of feedback I've been, been given so far, and you can contradict me if I'm wrong at the, over lunch or something, <laughs> there's, it's, it's, it's still too risky collaborating with new players. We, you know, government does see big IT projects as risky, of course, but trying to get into bed, if you like, or collaborate with new players, especially SMEs who haven't got much experience, is very, very risky. And the negotiation and contractual process is very, very time-consuming and difficult. So this seems to be maybe an unanticipated, but it could have been anticipated problem, which many people are now talking about, certainly. But, um, and this idea that some of the large suppliers um, are sort of coming back in and cutting their prices to sort of lost leaders and try to get back in on the act, you know, uh, when they can see that there are difficulties going on. Now, uh, I don't know how true this is, but this is certainly from reliable sources, right? <laughs> Non-quotable sources. <laughs> um, may maybe what is needed is, 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 is some sort of hub-and-spoke uh, model, more where these SME constellations, they, 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 they cooperate in some way, and they can be maybe a single point of contact uh, with different uh, constellations of SMEs, which can negotiate much more powerfully, uh, more directly with government. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult issue to get around. I mean, the aspiration of getting more SMEs involved is a, is a good one, I think, because uh, it does help, you know, I think boost the economy and, and have lots of spin-offs and there's lots of evidence to show that that happens. But how do we get SMEs and, and, and other third parties like NGOs much more directly involved in doing this work with government? It can be very, very difficult, also from their perspective as well, because they haven't got the, the legal or other expertise to do these sorts of things. So anyway, um, I think I'll finish there. because I, got, I did have some other stuff to talk about, but uh, I know that coffee is getting... We're already over time by quite a long way. I probably think I've said enough to uh, maybe maybe uh, put the cat in amongst the pigeons with my uh, two UK colleagues. I don't know, but I think I've, I've tried to raise some issues there. The issue is that there there, are, there is some evidence that using e-government services wisely can actually have impacts on, on businesses. Clearly it can do, yeah? But the new mantra about getting businesses directly involved in the value chain uh, is interesting, and there are some success stories, but how do we do it successfully that can benefit both government, of course, and therefore the taxpayer, but also have beneficial spin-offs on the business community 
through growth and through jobs. And all these new things which are happening around I the ICT industry and, 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 and the growth of all those sorts of subcultures and e ecosystems, how those things can be boosted by better partnerships with government. That's the interesting thing. Every government you, I talk to is, is looking at these issues. The UK is probably a leader in trying to do it, but so far I think that the uh, evidence is, you know, interesting, but not, not necessarily convincing. Not that it ever will be convincing, I guess, you know. So, uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll rest my case there. I hope I've given you some food for thought on that, and uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, otherwise we can talk during the coffee break. Okay, thank you. I had a message that we are really behind the schedule, so we have really a very little, very little time for a few questions, if you have any. Okay, the first one. Hi, Jeremy. Um, Peter Brown. Uh, it's, it's rather a quick comment. The, firstly, in the Global Standards Consortium Oasis, we're developing something called the Transformational Government Framework, which actually covers a lot of the high level yeah, principles. Yeah. Of you're, you're from the UK, right? Sorry? Are you from the UK? No, I'm not. I'm, not. <laughs> I'm here as an independent consultant, but I'm also <laughs> representing the yeah. um, But I think your comment about there are big IT failures in the private sector, and why don't we talk about those, is interesting because mm. in the private sector, failure is costed into research and development. Right, yeah. Ah, failure okay. is something yeah. which is positive because you learn what, how not to Precisely. do things and can be written off against your costs. Whereas in the public sector, it's considered as a waste of taxpayers' money. Yep. So this yep. issue about public-private partnership, I think, goes to the heart of that sort of yep. issue because your public sectors, by cooperating with private sector, is able to offset some of that risk, which is difficult to write down as, mm. as investment on a public sector side because it's considered a waste of taxpayers' money, but which often the private sector is prepared to absorb in return for rewards for contracts for additional work. I just wondered if you had any sort of comments yeah, on that yeah. particular issue. No, I think one of the big issues, as I understand it, I'm a, I'm not, I wouldn't claim to be a top expert in this field, is that some, the contracts drawn up between many governments and big IT players have not been good enough in the past. You know? uh, and clearly, th th that contract, those sorts of contracts should include that issue. That it's, it's the private sector that takes the risk, and, as they normally do. You know? and, and I don't think that's often happened. You know? But so, a couple of the slides I, I didn't present were very much focusing on the more bottom-up as aspects, and there is some evidence that those work better. Because this idea that, that we should move towards this idea that failure is good is part, depends how you define failure. You know, I put it in inverted commas. Failure is good. It's how you learn. But the important thing is to fail small and to fail early. Right? Not to fail big and late. That's the important thing. The banks failed big and late, right? <laughs> we should fail, we should embrace, even in the public sector. This is part of the innovation paradigm after all. We're talking about it. Why not? Failure, we have to redefine it. Failure and risk are good as long as it's small and early and we're open about it and learn from it. You know? And if government can build that in as well, to this narrative within government. Uh, and I think some, the UK government, you know, rightly or wrongly, I think is trying to do that. And it's not just a political thing. I think the previous government went down that road as well to some extent. I think that's the way forward to some extent. But it's difficult to do. Difficult to do. Second question is from Mario. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I would actually like to pick up on uh, uh, Chan's, uh, uh, Peter, sorry, um, point. And I would like to claim, actually, that uh, we should not necessarily only talk about failure, but also I think there are successes yeah. about the government investments. And uh, the question then is, well, how we measure them uh, and uh, when exactly we can claim well, this is really a failure now, or isn't uh, the way along the investment already also some kind of learning and transformation? And, well, we have to come to, com to common agreements on, well, when can we say this is really a failure now, or is it uh, more investment and at least there is some value? Um, maybe you can argue a little bit how we can assess that. 
Well, as I said, I, I mean, I think, you know, this idea that the failure is good as long as it's small and early and you can learn from it and then scale up must be part of that because we have to, re, we don't, we have to get away maybe from this word failure, I think, because it's, it's really an experimental thing. We need to experiment with this in, in, in things. And some of these new ecosystems being built up around the open data platforms for in many countries, not just the UK. We're starting it in Denmark as well now. And the, the US has been the leader, although it's, you know, it's discussion, this big discussion about how good that is. I think as part of that process, you know, and part of the whole open government and collaborative government paradigm, you know, actually building, uh, building in risk through these competitions and failure and seeing what's best and then can it be scaled up if it's successful? You know, maybe not. doesn't matter. Maybe many solutions will be local solutions, right? Some of them have the potential to be scaled up or for other people to learn from them, you know? So identifying different routes out of that when, when, when we're doing some form of experimentation or, or fast prototyping or whatever we want to call it, you know? I mean, all these things have been around for donkey's years, right? <laughs> but, you know, we're coming back to it now because of what's happening with the money, money problems and also the open data and other movements. I think it's, and it's a very interesting uh, time on that con in that context. Sorry. Okay, yeah. and very short question and very short answer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Um, Ivartal, Estonia. Uh, Jeremy, I, uh, I had a problem with your second uh, sort of uh, stream of thought, uh, with, uh, okay. uh, when you are saying that business is a service provider, so government should go to people and uh, doing so through the businesses, yes? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, government going to businesses. Sorry, yes, sorry. Uh, Governments going to businesses, yeah. well, uh, uh, and using well, government going to citizens. I mean, yes. closer yeah. using technology, but uh, doing that uh, with the help of businesses. Now, uh, isn't it uh, sort of camouflaging the big government idea? I mean, you just uh, give some of the universal services, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the yeah. business sort of coat over uh, overcoat. Uh, and instead, uh, uh, I mean, uh, shouldn't we be more elective looking at the service provision? I mean, this is a political question almost. Yes. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to see your reaction because you have both a British and uh, sort of Danish background. I mean, the British would start crying uh, uh, at this idea, I think, whereas Danish would probably embrace it, no? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Are you talking about, you know, the universal service application? Right, I mean, because going down this route actually means that we get a lot of much greater variation, right? Is that sort of the point you're saying? And uh, between, you know, depending where you live and, and who you are, your, the service quality offered to you varies, you know, is different, right? Because one of the big problems in all these developments is you know, how do we ensure minimum standards? How do we ensure quality, right? And what is the role of government in that context? When government sort of stands back and it's more arm's length and getting a lot of this stuff done, which is great and innovative and, and serves lots of maybe niche needs, but m many people m miss out on that, especially if they haven't got a strong voice, right? To some extent, yeah. So that, that's the big challenge, yeah. I mean, top-down centralized services, one size fits all, are good in the sense that everybody has the same and this is minimum standard and you, and you no one's disenfranchised, it's equal for everybody. But that doesn't serve the needs of most people, we know that, right? <laughs> so some sort of balance between those two things. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but uh, <laughs> maybe not. We can talk at coffee, but, but, but this is a huge challenge, yeah? I mean, government is not like the private sector. Government has to serve everybody, it can't, say, it can't choose its customers, right? With the private sector can. So government has to make sure that everybody gets the best services possible in that context. Yeah? And uh, doing these sorts of initiatives, to some extent, move, move us away from that. Yeah? Possibly. Okay. Jeremy, it was a re really excellent inspiration. We have to discuss the issue during the coffee break. So you are invited to the coffee break. We have the coffee break downstairs, exactly here. So, and I think we have uh, not so much time to do it. Thank you very much for uh, the participating on this, uh, on this session. Thank you.